Hi, um, welcome everybody to the Seagrass Seminar Series. This is our fourth installment in the series. We've been enjoying learning about seagrasses all year. Uh, my name is Jesse Jarvis. I am the president of the World Seagrass Association, and um, I, we are presenting this series on behalf of the International Seagrass Biology Workshop, which hopefully you guys are planning to attend in August 2022. Um, today, we are lucky enough to have three amazing speakers talk about effectively planning uh, seagrass research, education, and conservation, conservation using social media and online platforms. Our speakers are Jen McHugh, Dr. Abby Scott, and Dr. Ashley Scarlett. We're going to start out with Jen, and I'll give an introduction for each of the speakers as we go along. I do ask that you put any of your questions in the chat. We're going to save the questions for a sort of final wrap up at the end. So please write them down or put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them after all the speakers have um, had a chance to speak. So first up is Jen McHugh. She is the program coordinator at the Cairns Institute at James Cook University. Her background is in social science and she has mentored and trained over 80 TEDx speakers. Uh, she's also worked with scientists from a broad range of disciplines to improve and translate science communication. Despite being an, an expert in this topic, Jen has an actual pretty big fear of public speaking. So we're really excited to have her here to show us how uh, she has been able to communicate science despite having a little bit of fear there. So Jen, <laughs> with that, we'll pass it on to you. Thank you, Abby. That's gorgeous. I'll just share my screen. A little bit of fear is a little bit underrated. I am shaking in my boots and I have incredible imposter syndrome being anywhere near Abby and Ashley and yourself. So thank you for the invitation. Um, my presentation is going to focus a little bit more on actually presenting. So, uh, which, you know, less social media, but the other two have got you covered there. So if you think you're not getting what you've tuned in for, don't worry, it's coming. So to begin with, um, if your presentation isn't about you, then who's it about? Well, obviously it's about your audience. If you, if we all tend to think that presenting is about getting every little bit of skerrick of knowledge that we have out. But public speaking is actually about your audience. It's about making your audience hear something. You want to motivate the audience to make a change or to think of something differently. You want to raise an awareness. So you won't achieve any of your goals, no matter what they are, if your audience tunes out. This would be my favorite kind of audience. I'm trying to imagine that's what's happening right now. Um, and, you know, it'd be great if we only ever spoke to an empty room. It'd just be like talking to our friends. But science communication is often aimed at the public or general public. Now, who or what that is, is anybody's guess. It's very, very hard to define a general audience. Yet it's something that's really important. Getting a sense of what your audience will or won't understand is, is really important in getting that information across. Now, unless you live as a hermit or a deserted island, you have family and friends. So my advice is ask them. We often turn to our colleagues to practice or, um, or for guidance on our talks and presentations, but really we should be asking non-science friends. Discuss topics with your hairdresser, your tradesman, your family, your friends. Bring up your ideas in conversation and get an idea of what people can and can't understand. So, for example, for TEDx, we ask scientists from various disciplines to give a test presentation in front of an audience which consists of anyone we can rope in. And I mean, we have the cleaners there, we have students, we have other speakers, we have teenagers, we have Toastmasters, you name it. They've all been given the opportunity to critique a scientist's presentation. Now, if done right, this form of like constructive criticism is very powerful. Now, I'm not really sure if we can um, attribute this to Einstein, but I'm sure someone really smart did say it. The challenge is it can be a really fine line. As if you dumb down your presentation, it can come across as very patronizing. So generally when speaking to an audience um, of non-scientists, try and avoid jargon. If you are speaking to your peers, and by all means be as technical as you like, but communicating science to a general audience, please keep the technical terms to a bare minimum. It doesn't matter how smart you sound if it falls on deaf ears. The other important thing is that you can't give the audience the book. You really are just going to give them the cover. I mean, you are highly trained and skilled and you've got years of research behind you. Getting all that knowledge out on that particular topic is impossible. But if you can give enough big enough tease, then people will go and find out more for themselves. Now, generally, an audience won't remember what you say, but they will remember how you make them feel. So how do you make an audience feel? Well, I guess you start with yourself. Why do you care? 
Why are you so passionate about this subject? Try and think of connecting with an audience and remind them that you're a human and not a lab coat. For example, say you found the cure for malaria. That's fabulous, Nobel Prize on the way and people politely clap. But if you say that you started studying malaria because your dog, grandma, someone close to you died, suddenly people are engaged. Helping understand what motivates you can help build trust and connections. So ask yourself what got you into science and why are you so passionate? As you heard, I'm a very, very contented background person. I do generally love being in the background and I honestly think public speaking is unnatural. It terrifies me. I get it why some people rate it higher than a fear of death. And the reason why we tend to hate public speaking is because it triggers our body's natural reaction to stress, the fight or flight response. And I know it's fairly ironic that someone who's terrified a public speaker is a cur curator and mentor for others. But I guess I honestly, honestly believe that communication is powerful. I have seen many benefits for others, both professionally and personally. And I, and I do love people. I'm really passionate about people. I am one. Some of my best friends are people. And while being in the background is, is my happy place, I have met so many people with great things to, start, to say, stories to tell, and I'm happy to give them a voice. I've seen so many people absolutely shaking, no matter what their, what their position is, shaking like a leaf before they go on stage. But they always come off saying they're very glad they've done it. And I'm sure, you know, you, you're here because you understand that science communication is important and you understand the impact it can have on your work. So if you're like me and you'd rather be anywhere other than presenting, here are a few tips I have picked up from um, coaching over 80 speakers from nine-year-olds to distinguished professors. So firstly, good presentations aren't presentations. They really are conversations. Beating people over the head with information rarely works but having a chat can have impact. You are just expanding the conversations you have with your colleagues or with your friends. Generally, you aren't presenting on something you don't know about. You're presenting on something that you're passionate about or you have deep knowledge. So share that passion. Don't forget you are the expert. Practice, practice, and of course, practice some more. And if you feel nervous, don't be frightened to own that. Generally, people can understand. You can kind of almost make a joke. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd rather be underwater. I'm more comfortable under, you know. 30 meters of water, whatever works for you. But glossophobia or fear of public speaking is the single most common phobia. It can affect four out of 10 people. This one's important. Don't imagine your audience naked. It could leave you with some very disturbing images. But looking at a friendly face can definitely help. Try and make eye contact as much as possible. And um, some people say that if they press their thumb and their forefinger together, you can hold it behind your back and just apply pressure that can help relieve nerves. Try it. If it works for you, use it. If it doesn't, don't. And don't worry if you forget something. You may have spent days agonizing over every single word in your presentation, and then you realize you've forgotten an important part. But don't worry, your audience hasn't got your script. They don't know what you're going to say. If you think the point you've missed is important, then just say, look, I'm really sorry, I should have included, or I forgot. And don't, because don't view your audience as, as waiting for you to fail. Think about how you watch um, presentations. The audience really generally is on your side. They don't want to watch something that they don't like. Only the most sadistic of us start watching a presentation, hoping the presenter will stuff up. It's also really important to remember the power of the pause. You can, it allows you to catch your breath, tell the audience it's an important point. It can draw the audience in. And you don't need to fill every second of your, your allotted time with words. Intended silence also speaks volumes. Well, it's great to be super enthusiastic and it's so good to be here and we're really, really happy and I'm just so passionate. That gets old really, really quickly. As does speaking in a tone like this, monotone voices are boring. Your talk needs light and shade and you can give that light and shade by using your voice. Of course, don't overcomplicate your slides. Keep text to a minimum. If you're using a slides, a good trick is a six by six. So six dot points or bullet points at most and six words per point. Quotes are a little different. And a lot of people will use their slide as a visual reminder. They'll think, okay, for this slide, I have X amount of points I want to raise. One thing, and myself, it's my personal pet peeve, is when people just read from their slides. 
you'll have a speaker and they'll put up a whole heap of information on this slide and then they'll read it word for word. And you think, well, what, why did you bother? And unless you, unless there, there's uh, visual challenges or language challenges, people can generally read. So let them. And while my presentation and my experience has mainly been on in-person or recorded interviews, the world has changed and more and more we are presenting online, such as today. The majority of the previous tips still work in that case, especially around using your voice and your slides. And while it's hard to do in a 10 minute presentation, don't be frightened to make them interactive. There's a lot of free options available. I'm sure Abby and Ashley will tell you more, but you know, check out Mentimeter, for example, encourage tweeting or other social media. And if you're using the chat, it's great if you can have someone in the room that can actually monitor the chat or monitor these channels for you. Of course, there's usual tips around lighting and equipment, which sometimes can be out of your control. I was forced to get a new camera yesterday and I think I look like a beetroot. And the other thing you can do, another great tip, is start your presentation with a question and end with a call to arms. So for example, you may start with, um, why should you care about seagrass? And then you end your presentation by telling people why they should care about seagrass let, and let them know what they can do, let them know how they can be engaged and let them know how they can help. The other thing is learn from others. So finally, learn from others. If you see a great presentation, ask yourself, what did that presenter do to get my attention? How did they make me feel? Is there anything you could learn or apply to your own presentations? This is actually one of my favorite talks, um, The Secret Structure of Great Talks. I highly recommend if you want to know more to um, check it out if you haven't done so already. And finally, as science communicators, you are simply sharing magic with the world. The, my, I'll leave you with this tip that you should always, always be grateful to the turtles and the dugongs. Convincing people that it's important to watch grass grow can be an uphill battle. The very cute dugongs, turtles, and other marine life should always get some attention. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> All right, Jen, thank you so much. That was a great talk. Thank you. And remember, we will be asking questions for everybody after all the speakers have presented. So thank you, Jen. Awesome job. Our next speaker up is Dr. Abby Scott. So Abby is a research officer also at James Cook University, uh, but she's in, they're both in Cairns. So she recently completed her PhD. And her research investigates the role of herbivory in structuring seagrass meadows and the Great Barrier Reef. She is passionate about communicating seagrass science and social media and at public events. And she also has a monthly radio segment and is on the organizing committee for the Pint of si Science Festival in Australia. So with that, I will pass it on to you, Abby. Thank you very much, Jesse, uh, And thanks for everybody for coming and watching. And I'm really excited to be here um, talking to fellow seagrass lovers about uh, sharing seagrass science. So I'm gonna to touch on some of the ways that I've been able to share seagrass science through, for my lab and throughout my PhD, which I keep saying I've just finished, but it's almost been a year now, so probably should leave that behind. Um, so as Jesse mentioned, I'm a research officer at James Cook University in Cairns, and a lot of my research has focused on the impact of herbivores on seagrass meadows and the impact of grazing. Mm -hmm. Um, so as Jen mentioned, I have been able to use turtles and dugongs to uh, communicate the importance of seagrass science. And it is great to have a mega herbivore or two to help you explain why seagrass meadows are important. But I did start my seagrass science career back in England, as you can probably tell from the English accent, that's where I'm from. And so communicating the importance of seagrass meadows in the UK is a little bit more of a challenge perhaps than um, than we have here in Australia with all of those big mega herbivores. So I do have some experience of trying to communicate the more challenging aspects of this seagrass meadows, I suppose. Uh, it's not all turtles and dugongs. Uh, and in terms of my experience communicating science, as Jesse mentioned a few of the things, I've got a monthly 30 minute uh, radio show on our local radio here, not just talking about seagrass, although I try and squeeze that in wherever I can, but sharing lots of different science. Um, I run our Twitter for our, our lab group here in Cairns, and we've also recently started trying to use Instagram a little bit more. Um, I've managed to get my research out into the media in a few different ways. So yeah, basically just trying to communicate seagrass science in as many different ways as possible and get the message out there. So why should we communicate seagrass science? Well, 
there's a, a few different reasons that people might have for communicating their science in general. Perhaps they want to network, they want to um, get in touch with funders, uh, motivate the local community to care about what they're doing. And these are all great reasons, but I wanna talk to you specifically about why we need to talk about seagrass in, in the public world, okay? So we all know these other marine ecosystems have got a pretty good name, you know, coral reefs, no one really needs to sell that. If you go snorkeling on a coral reef, you'll be amazed, you'll come back with pictures of coral. But if you go snorkeling in a seagrass meadow, you might come back with pictures of turtles and just turtles. You might not even realize that the seagrass meadow was there. And I think that is the problem for seagrasses, unfortunately. They're a little bit underappreciated, um, I guess, from a biased point of view of someone who loves seagrasses, right? Um, but they're a bit underappreciated and they need a bit more, a, a bit more of the hard sell. We need to tell people why they're so amazing because we don't really need to have this perception that if we tell people about seagrasses, they're going to be bored because. In my experience, as long as you get the messaging right, people are really interested to hear about seagrasses um, and, and really engaged with seagrass meadows. They're just not aware that they're even there a lot of the time. So I think it's kind of our duty to, to explain that to people and tell them more about why seagrasses are so amazing. So how can we do this? How can we share the magic and the wonder of seagrass science with the world? Well, there's a few different ways. And you're doing all of these on a day-to-day -day basis, right? As a seagrass scientist, you're talking to people about what you're up to. Um, you can go on podcasts, go on the radio, audio mediums. You might be taking videos while you're out doing field work. You can share these. You can write blogs or contribute to trying to get your research out into the media. And then there are online platforms as well. So there's lots and lots of different ways. Um, and just remember that you're sharing your seagrass science all of the time when you're talking to people, when you're talking to your friends, your colleagues. So it's not something that's really different to what you're already doing, but there might just be some value in thinking about how to do it slightly differently. So if we're thinking about online platforms, there are a lot, but the two key ones that, that I've been using, but it depends on what your interest is, uh, you might want to use different ones, but the big ones in terms of science communication is Twitter. Um, and Twitter is really good for networking with other scientists and reaching the media. It can be a bit harder to reach members of the public on Twitter. Um, it can be a bit like talking into an echo chamber, but there, you, you can still engage with the local community as well. And Instagram is another big one that I've been using. Um, it seems to be a bit better for general outreach. Um, but it's not as good as Twitter, I don't think, for sharing other people's content in terms of resharing other things. Um, and you've obviously got to have some good photos and videos to go with it. So the key thing with this is when you're using your online platforms, you need to understand how to use them and understand that your audience might be a bit different for each of these. But if you're going to go and invest in one of these, invest your time and your efforts um, go with what works for you, but also just bear in mind who your audience is on each of those, because you need something that works for you if you're going to be using it. But also ju just remember who you might be talking to, really. So what are the benefits? Well, I'll give you a few key examples from some of the things that we've done. Um, so obviously, I'm not a professional science communicator. I'm somebody who's just trying to fit some of the communication into my day to day science job uh, and really passionate about sharing that. So in terms of being strategic and uh, producing kind of high quality content. I perhaps don't have the time and the skills for that, but even in terms of just getting some of the messaging out there, there can be some really, really big benefits. So you can share your research with the public. So if you look at this tweet from a while ago that I did, we, I managed to get almost 7,000 videos, uh, sorry, 7,000 views on this video uh, of a shovel nose shark swimming through a seagrass meadow. Um, and you can also make videos to show people what being a scientist is really like or more about seagrasses. So it's definitely a great way to engage with the public. It's also really good in terms of working with your partners and your funders. So uh, I use this as an example. This was a tweet that Tim Smith from our lab did recently when he went up to WIPA. He took this video of an inhaler's flower and some pollen. Uh, I couldn't get the video to load on the PowerPoint, but you'll just have to go to our Twitter page to have a look at it. Um, and our partners or funders, North Queensland Bulk Ports, 
saw this tweet, which was really popular, um, and a series of other tweets from the field and asked him to write a blog for their website. So really good in terms of getting your research out on another platform and engaging with your partners and funders as well. It can be really good for sharing your research with the media. So even if you're not writing a media release, for example, when we were going to sample our tea bags for the tea composition study at Green Island, I just took a GoPro, got a little bit of footage of us doing the sampling and um, put that up on Twitter. And we got some interest from the local TV uh, without having to, to go through the normal media channels. They were just interested in what we were up to. And so we got featured or Paul York got featured on, on the local news. Um, and that's the same with my radio show as well. So I've been engaging with the journalists on Twitter and someone, one of the local journalists after a while asked me if I'd be keen to come on the radio. And so that's how that started. Another really important thing is connecting with other seagrass scientists on social media. And so that's been really important for me. Um, I found my PhD on Twitter and I saw it advertised there. So it's great to be able to find out what other people are up to, share your own research, network with people, um, contribute in conferences. I know there's an online Twitter conference at the minute that the GLOW team are running down in Griffith. So there can be conferences completely online or networking with people when you're there. So it's just a really nice way to be able to network with other scientists as well. So how can you be strategic about it? Um, I know that we're all really busy and it can be really hard to find the time to, to do these kind of things, make these videos, but there are some ways that you can just maximize what you're already doing to turn it into really interesting content and put it out there. So take photos and videos while you're in the field, even while you're in the lab sometimes if you see something cool. Um, so photos and videos can really help to tell the story of your research, but only if you take good photos, so I know that we're probably all taking pictures when we're in the video, taking pictures when we're in the field to document what's happening um, and to our field sites, but maybe just take a couple of minutes and think, okay, what photos or footage might be useful for me when I'm talking about this uh, later? And just take a couple of pictures that really tell the story of what's happening, because these can be so, so useful when you're trying to get those messages out there. And when you do that, Make sure you put them to good use. Don't just file them away. Um, get them out there into the world. You know, share them on social media. If you've got footage, kind of try and edit that together. Like I said, I'm definitely not a professional. I'm getting more skills when it comes to these things. But even just being able to put some of that footage out there and share your message with everybody is really important. And including it in things like graphical abstracts um, and kind of social media posts about your research and about the results is, is really important. And take advantage of opportunities to share your research on other people's online platforms and events. Um, so I run the Pint of Science Festival, that's, that's what this picture is from. But if, if someone asks you to go and speak at an event where there's a bit of a different audience, take advantage of that or go on a podcast or Twitter takeovers or get your university to share what you're up to. Um, just Take advantage of any of these things that you're asked to do, especially if you think you might be able to reach a new audience. And that goes for in-person and online events. And when you do these things, don't be afraid to share them. I know it feels can feel really, really weird to, to just be posting videos of yourself or whatever. But if you've made the effort to produce some social media content, then, then share it because that's the whole point of it, right? And get your university to share it as well. And Within the seagrass community, I know everybody's really good at sharing everybody else's material and content when you put that out on social media. So don't be afraid to share these things because you just never know who's going to see them. You know, it's really good to be strategic and get a really big audience for what you're saying. But you also, even if you have a small audience, you never know who might be watching. So just share it and you, you just you don't know what could come of that. So don't be afraid. So in conclusion, these online tools are a really great way to share the seagrass science and we should all be sharing seagrass science to try and uh, help people understand the importance of seagrass meadows. And I think we've come a long way with that in the past few years. You know, there's lots of people, the guys from Project Seagrass, lots of researchers really putting those messages out there. And I think seagrass is starting to get the really cool, wonderful reputation that it deserves. So um, yeah, fellow seagrass nerds, let's, let's recruit some more seagrass nerds to, to, to the team. <laughs> um, and social media is also a great way to network with other scientists and people from the media. You just never know who you can reach with this kind of stuff. So 
pick a social media platform or an online way to communicate that you like and get creative and, and give it a go because you're only going to build up your skills from here. So I'll see you all online. Thank you, Abby. That was awesome. Thank you so much. All right. All right, so we are on to our third speaker for the evening, and then we'll get to the question part of it, which I know I'm sure you guys have lots of questions already, so this is great. Um, we're now going to have Dr. Ashley Scarlett, uh, who is a marine conservation and science communication specialist. Uh, her doctorate degree is in interdisciplinary natural and social science and has a master's degree in effective science communications. Um, she has started her career organizing large events like environmental festivals and, and other environmental campaigns. Um, and so now she is an expert on getting your, your, your information out there and helping with um, ways to actually make people interested also in what you're doing. Uh, so she has her, her clients that um, for her production company include uh, the AAAS, so um, the Sci on the Fly podcast and her own, she's the editor of the Marine Conservation Happy Hour podcast. So lots of places where you can find Ashley. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I am, uh, I'm actually a paid um, science or social media marketer. Um, I am also um, a, I'm a host and a producer of the Marine Conservation Happy Hour. I'm paid to be a host for the Marine Mammal Science podcast. I have, um, I'm also the producer and the host of the Guide to Con uh, Mindful Conservation. And I um, created the Mindful Conservation Conference that has a bunch of mindful um, events during the year. And I am here to help you make your social media work. Um, and so with that, we're going to um, talk about a few things. So we're gonna talk about science, communication, and social media, all the components that are involved in that. Um, like I said, this is like, I'm, I'm definitely go, I can go really deep into this, but I, I only have 15 minutes, so I'm gonna try to pack as much as possible in 15 minutes. So this is just an introductory, presentation, but I want it to empower you and make you creatively think how you could take all these tips and put it to great use. So let's get it started. Here we go. All right. So there's a lot of components that are involved when you are going to do any type of social media post, and it takes skills. There is a lot of research involved in each of these things. So we're going to talk about communication. We're going to talk about platform. We're going to talk about presentation and execution. Again, everything underneath these are a skill and they have do's and don'ts to it. Um, and so we will try to get into as many as possible in this presentation. Again, like Abby said, there's platforms, make sure you get the right audience and pick, don't pick so many, don't pick a bunch of them, focus on two. That's probably like the best thing to do if you're just starting out. Focus on two and remember that each, each of these types of platforms have to have a certain type of post. There's multiple things that go involved in, or that are involved in it. So let's let's look at that really quickly. So let's look at Australia. Okay. So Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram is the leading social media platforms right now. So that would be if I was if I was your marketer, I would say let's focus on these. Okay. And that's when you're going to have to think, okay, my content on Facebook is going to be this. My content on YouTube is going to be this. And my Instagram today is going to be this way. So you've got to think about how you're going to focus. Don't, don't put all your eggs um, in multiple places. Focus on one. Next step. Here we go. Now that you figured out your platform, I want you to think about your presentation. There's a lot involved in your presentation. Okay. How are you going to do it? Are you going to go Facebook Live? Are you going to do a video? Okay. So let's look at this. Is it going to be a podcast? Are you going to present your podcast on your YouTube? Multiple um, um, 
uh, multiple platforms. How are you going to do multiple platforms? Which kind of program are you going to use? The, if you're going to use a gift, again, don't repeat the same content over and over again. You've got to keep everything really, really clean and nice and tight. Here's another thing. You got to think about how many words you're going to do, how many minutes your video is going to be. Is it going to be audio? Is it not going to be audio? Q and A's, polls, testimonials, retweets, engage with your, your other, your communities, um, post use those. So now we have to think about effective communication and here's where my master's thesis comes in. So I test, I, I did a lot of behavioral change and how to influence, how to get your point across, how to make a change. you got to make sure that you're communicating the right stuff. So let's look over what's effective communication. Make it simple. Okay. Like, just like, um, Jennifer said, easy words, simplicity, that's what you want. So again, the, we're going to talk about like success. Think of it like success, right? So unexpected things. Put something in a video that's like, bah, surprises people, okay? And you always want to put it a little bit further into the video. Make sure it's concrete. Make sure that it's something that people can visualize themselves, see themselves in or part of it. Credibility. Get someone the community really likes. This is what I love about like retweeting someone else's stuff um, or getting testimonials. People like to see that you are engaging with another community member and then they're trusting that community member. So think about that kind of thing. Emotions. That was incredible what Jennifer was saying about emotional. Yes, absolutely. However, be careful. Don't do the Sarah McLaughlin effect, okay? Don't make it too sad where you, you're crying about puppies, you know what I mean? Where you want to change the channel. you got to make sure that there's like multiple um, emotions that are involved. Okay, and then the last thing is going, oh, sorry, I did credibility. So credible, you might, like family members, we, it was something that we mentioned, um, a leader, and then, um, so you know what credibility is. And stories, I love it. Abby was mentioning stories. Go ahead, do a story, love it. Now we're at execution. Execution is crucial. I see this all the time being a problem. All right. I want you to be like focus on your execution. Must be consistent. You got to make sure that if you're going to do one post a week, do one post a week and make sure it's the same time, this and that or whatever. Okay. Can, can think about it. Are you going to do it daily? Are you going to do it weekly? Are you going to do three posts a day? And then what time does this need to be? This is going to change everywhere depending on your audience. Hashtags. Hashtags is a whole nother research. It is a whole nother research. I'm not joking when I'm trying to tell you I, I probably spend seven hours a day on social media. I know what hashtags are hot. I know why they're hot. How can we involve our hashtags into it? These are the types of things that you need to think about. Also, you need to think too many hashtags on one platform will be too much. No one likes that. Other platforms, all the hashtags. So again, think about the community that you want to engage where, where are their hash? What are they hashtagging? Okay. And then engage with those people and with the hashtags. All right. Here's another one that drives me crazy. It drives me crazy. Aspect ratios. I see this all the time where you see someone put too big of a picture on Instagram and it's cutting it off. No one wants to see that. It's not professional. So you got if you're going to put repost one picture on all your different platforms, okay, fine, but make sure you size each of them, okay? Make sure it's perfect. Think of all the pixels, everything like that. Links. Links, links, links. Too many links can be overwhelming. Um, and then, you know, and then you need to make, think, think about where are you going to place your link? All right. And then respond, respond, respond. I sit on social media and I respond to everyone that engages. You have to respond within a certain amount of time in order to get that following, that 
um, that connection with people. So make comments, like their stuff. And, and, and like I said, this is a lot of work, but it can be in incredible. And so I hope that I didn't overwhelm you, but it, all these little tips are able to help you um, expand your non-charismatic campaign. And I'm telling you, you can make anything go viral. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was awesome. All right. <laughs> Thank you to all of our speakers. So Jen, Abby, and Ashley, thank you guys very much. If you can throw me in a, a round of applause or whatever the emoji is on the screen. Thank you guys. Um, so now we're at the part in the uh, series where I think people have sort of the most, I look forward to the most, which is the time we answer questions. So y'all can either um, type up your questions in the chat and I'm monitoring that, or you can actually go ahead and uh, meet yourself and ask a question. So the floor is now open. Thank you for this uh, webinar. Um, I appreciate it so much, and it's the first time I have attended it. I missed the rest for the World Seed Restaurant Association uh, series. Um, this question is more for Miss Abby, for Doc Abby. Doc Abby, I appreciate your um, your sharing focus, uh, but uh, would you be stopping only at sharing? For example, if we feature in a high biodiversity biodiversity spot like the Philippines, um, while we want to feature a lot of new things we find, we are also at the same a hot spot for poaching and a lot of more uh, more challenges. Um, so what do we do? Yeah, that's a that's a really good point actually in terms of of sharing your science, uh, you've got to be careful. And you don't want to be sharing uh, too much or something that you, you're going to want to publish later. So you need to be careful in that respect. And then in the respect of, yeah, poaching or other possible negative impacts, like I mean, even stupid examples, like if you post pictures of yourself in the field and you're not wearing the right fieldwork gear, mm -hmm. people might see that. That's happened to us. And um, even even with that tea bag video that I put up, um, then somebody from the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority was watching that and asking where our permit was for digging up tea bags. So you've got to be really, really mindful of all of these things. Um, I think as long as you're mindful, you can share, you can still share what you're up to, but you just have to be careful in leaving out those details or making things general enough, or perhaps even having a bit more of a time lag. So if something's time sensitive, you know, poaching or something, um, you just just got to think about your angle, which is definitely more challenging, but I think you, you can still do it. You just, just avoid those touchy areas of it, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, I hope, uh, may I make a follow-up uh, comment? Um, yeah. uh, um, I want to be part of that. Uh, it's uh, citizen science. It's, Secret citizen science is what I want to, uh, to be part of. I know there are some groups here that are starting and are using Facebook for a platform. Uh, but I learned so much from the, the points of Ma'am Jenny and Ma'am Ashley about consistency and regularity, uh, so to speak, uh, because we want to pick up on and on on what now the playing the playing field now is for coral reefs and mangroves. Sea grasses have always been left behind, like you said. And I'd like to say, emphasize that it's not just a little bit underappreciated. It really is underappreciated. Thank you so much for this, uh, ma'am. Yeah, I totally agree with you on the underappreciated aspect of sea grasses. And yeah, and, and I know that posting regularly is really important, but Bear in mind that you, if you're busy, you know, you can only do what you can do. And if you're trying to post regularly, like don't let it hold you back from creating an account or, or a Facebook page to engage with people and then just try and engage as regularly as you can. But if you can't, as long as you're putting those messages out there and you're being mindful of how to do that and how to do it effectively and engage, engage with people, then, then that's a great start, I think. Thank you for that. <clears throat> Thank you for the questions. Um, so we have a question in the chat. Can partnering with social media from other study groups with more public appeal, such as coral reefs, uh, be a good idea for introducing seagrass to new audiences? So let's throw that out there to anybody, actually. Uh, well, I would say yes, absolutely, 100%. Um, 
and involving seagrasses in so, so some of the work that we've been doing in the Great Barrier Reef, we've been involved in some of the big citizen science projects and, and trying to introduce seagrass into those and, and piggyback off of those bigger coral reef citizen science projects. I think that's a, that's a great way to get um, people interested. And one of my main lines that I use when I'm talking about seagrass is that there's more seagrass in the Great Barrier Reef than, than coral. So, um, you know, we can, we can beat them at their own game too. <laughs> oh. I think kind of building off of this question, I, would, I was going to ask, uh, Jen, with, with sort of the TEDx kind of um, space, like where, did you mention sort of they're pairing the seagrass with the dugong? Are there any other sort of ways or any of the groups you think would be sort of a good fit or other hooks you've seen that are kind of unexpected that could be helpful to put out there for a good presentation with seagrass? Oh, hooks for in terms of seagrass. There's, there's lots. I think really i mean our process usually is is to sit down with each speaker and talk to them and usually it's in that conversation you find out what their passion is or what their motivation is so i think often the hook is is what mo is really comes down to the individual what motivates you so if you're passionate about something then you should be able to engage someone else in that passion you know so and i think uh seagrass like i was i was just sort of saying to um to Abby yesterday, and this is my view as a non seagrass, non real science person, was you know imagine picture the most beautiful botanical garden you've ever been in, and all and then the first thing you picture, of course, is all the lovely flowers and all the flowering plants. But then imagine that botanical garden without any grass, you know. So I think really um, you know seagrass is is like that. Like what, what would the ocean be like without it? Which is it's harder to get across. But generally, if someone has a, is, has a passion, that will come out and that's the overriding thing. And so we had one scientist who's doing tuberculosis, but who knew that his actual passion for tuberculosis came because as a child in, um, in Germany, some cows got it as a kid. And so like, wow, that's actually really interesting. And that gives you this whole other interest in like his grandfather's farm. So, you know, I think that's a really good way to connect. Awesome. And I throw that out there to Ashley as well, actually, as some of a question about, you know, when we're, because you've had some experience kind of putting some lesser charismatic uh, of your of your clients um, out there. So what, you know, when, what was something you would maybe focus on to help um, increase the interaction with seagrasses? I know we have like the dugongs and the turtles. Um, is there anything else that you would maybe suggest, Ashley, that you think would be a good way to kind of increase our engagement with our, I know it no, depends on the like platform. So totally. And, and if I, if like, I knew specifically like what exactly you were trying to um, communicate, then we mm -hmm. could create that specific thing. And yeah. so like, but my biggest thing is like, if you want to do something quick, I would start doing polls, literally polls. I like in, in cool ones, fun ones that are like, um, what, what, what does this, what, what do you think does this? And then have like different types of seagrass or something like that. And then when you see people like, um, po post or comment, then engage with them. And then when you see someone respond, go to their page and like their stuff, you know what I mean? So then they can see that you act, they, you notice them. That's like the biggest thing about social media is no, is trying to create that engagement. Um, so the Q and A's are a huge thing. Um, that would be incredible where you ask, you know, you allow a time and place for anyone to ask you a question. That's great stuff. You know what I mean? Um, so I, I think it's like specific to what you really, really want. But if you're trying to find quick things, this is what I say. Think opposite stuff okay mondays are our poll days tuesdays a picture day wednesdays a gift day thursdays a video day and that's what you're going to do another additional thing that you want to do is have a sprinkle of things so think like if you're not able and i understand that not everyone can be on social media all the time because it's not their job to do that i get it so if you can't stay and do a bunch of tweets every day tweet other people's stuff and have it mixed in okay i see this a problem all the time on other um organizations where it's only everyone else's tweet 
And what that shows an audience is that you don't have original content to give them. Do you see what I'm saying? So there's all these like little things that you need to think about. But again, it's like, do a nice blend, salt and pepper, salt and pepper. Abby actually called me out about my, uh, it was a, at the surf meeting in, um, in 2019, where she was like, why do you only, why are all your tweets just like a link to your Instagram? <laughs> <laughs> did oh, did I? <laughs> I because not... it's really bad because the pop, the photos don't come up then. Right? No, I know, and I stopped doing it immediately. The people noticed, right? <laughs> so that was the thing: was that like people noticed, and I was not savvy enough at the time, so I appreciated that. But anyway, no, and so, that's like what I was yeah. mentioning by don't repeat the same things mm -hmm. over and over again because people get bored. They're like, I already know that this person is going to keep doing the same retweets. Now right. that is, that is specific. And that's what I'm saying. If you want to share what you have on Instagram, then make it a whole different format and put it on Twitter. Okay. And here's another tip. You know, these are like, these are little tips that you kind of need. Remember who's, who owns what, because if you're taking an Instagram or, or like an Instagram thing that has, that you're sharing it, Twitter is not going to share it. It's not going to optimize your viewing because it's competitive. Do you see what I'm saying? So you have to consider posting different, different platforms with a, you know, with their own original content. Yes. And you also get made fun of at a conference if you don't. Um, <laughs> it was very nice. To it was great. I learned a lesson that day. It was helpful. It stuck with me, obviously. Um, any other questions for our speakers? Hey, so I have a question. This is Brooke. Um, I want to say that the, all of those presentations were amazing. Thank you so much. And um, so as you all know, we are gearing up for ISBW and the World Seagrass Conference in Annapolis um, this summer. And we have social media sites or uh, I guess accounts, not sites, but we are attempting to use social media. We've got a Twitter account, a Facebook account, and um, what's the other one? Instagram. I know more tonight now about how to actually interact on social media than I did before. But in general, do you all have any advice for us on how we can up our social media game to promote this, these like, um, well, it's one event, but the International Seagrass Biology Workshop and the conference together. We'll take any advice you've got. I think Abby's the queen of, of, of that. Oh, I don't know. I think it's probably a better question for Ashley. Um, in terms of actually getting things out there. Okay, so I did look at your, um, <laughs> I did look at your social media. I do have a list for you of the things that I would uh, definitely change or, or, or do. Um, your advertisement. Think about if it, that is engaging, you know what I mean? Did that just wow everyone? And then I, what I want you to do also too is multiple, have multiple types of flyers, okay? And do it once a week, once a week. Keep it going, keep it going. Don't post just one, one, or, one or two times. Post it all the time in different things. And then like they mentioned too, Abby was mentioning, go on um, podcast, go everywhere you possibly can and, and get your people out there um, talking about it. And that's how you're going to get um, this type of engagement. Right. And I think because you're awesome. like you're targeting seagrass scientists, right? When you're when you're trying to post about the conference, I guess primarily in the in the run up, you know, you can you can share a lot of the things that people have already been posting and kind of create that kind of community. You can start a list on Twitter so you can just keep up to date with what certain people are posting, or you can search hashtag seagrass or whatever. But you know, then you can just scroll through just to seagrass scientists, um, and you can easily keep up to date not just have a whole feed of everybody and share some of that science and create a little bit of a network there. Brooke, okay. can I just is it an in, it's an in-person conference yes. that you're hoping to do. So one of the things too is don't forget to promote the region. Like don't forget to promote why people want to come. So you know things about top five things to do why you're you know why you're here. Um, and you can also you know then look at you could look at your local tourism or touch base with your local tourism. Um, organizations and see what they have and, and sort of share their content and you know um, if it's a, a 
nice sunset cruise, pitch yourself here for the conference or, you know, something like that. That Because conferences, I think, in, in particular, people want to come for the learnings, but they also want to come for the experience. And they also want to come because they might be coming to somewhere new for them. So sell that point. Okay. Great. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. All right. Well, I think we'll do is we'll end that there. Um, thank you all so much for your sharing of your um, your knowledge and your information. And I'm sure people will be following, hopefully following up with you afterwards for more questions if they have any. Um, we will be posting this online. So maybe that'll get some interest as well. But can say thank you so much. And I know that um, I am particularly, and I think everybody has learned a lot tonight. So thank you all.